977-1070 is the phone number on The Schilling Show. We don't shy away from the difficult subjects, the difficult things of life, the things that people face in their own lives, the things that are ugly, the things that are evil and bad, the things that are beautiful. We don't shy away from talking about faith and God on this program, and also the counterpart to that, which would be lack of faith and lack of God in your life and evil that follows that. Today is a discussion that I think I... I um, I think is very important for this listening audience to, if not participate in, which you know you're welcome, to hear, because it's something that most people don't want to talk about because it is one of those things that's very difficult to talk about. And I want to make it very clear as we begin the conversation today that we're not here, and and it's never the case on this program, to, uh, to bash on post-abortive women or post-abortive men. And there is such a thing as that. We've had guests on the program who who are dealing with that issue as well. That's not the point of the program. What we want to do is offer hope to people who have been in a situation that they may regret or they may someday come to regret. And it's the purpose of a program like this today. If you decide to call in today uh, and you'd like to uh, ask a question or make a comment or perhaps disagree with the guests, you're welcome to do so at 977-1070. And I know uh, oftentimes when we have a difficult subject like this that it's difficult for you to call because this is a small community. But if you'd like to, uh, you know, this is true anytime, but particularly on a day like today, to use a different name or identity, you're certainly welcome to do that. It's not really the point of who's calling. It's what it is that you have to say or ask. And so I'm pleased to welcome to the show today uh, three people join me in studio. Steve Lopez returns. He's a pro-life filmmaker. We spent some time talking about the subject, oh, a couple months ago, and I asked him if maybe we could do a follow-up with uh, some other people that are involved in the pro-life movement. Christina Hampton is with us today also with uh, 40 Days for Life, and we'll talk about what that is. And Abigail Seidman is with us, a post-abortive pro-life mother who really has an amazing testimony. I read it this morning, and it was so sad, but it was also uplifting to see the changes that have happened in her life. But the the road that she went down, I think, is a lesson that I want people to take from today's conversation. It's a road you want to avoid, if at all possible. And uh, I want to welcome all of you to The Shilling Show today. Thanks for being here. So let's start off by asking each of you, just briefly, just for a minute or two, why it is you're here today, because many people say, well, this is a private matter, and we really shouldn't be talking about this. Let's start with Christina. Why are you here today, Christina? Um, I'm here today because I got involved in the pro-life effort a while back, Mm -hmm. and it has always touched me back then, because I'd hear the stories of people who had been through an abortion, and I know that it was by the grace of God that I didn't go down that path myself. Mm -hmm. Um. I was never actually in the position to make that decision, but I know based on the other decisions I've made in my life that I would have gone. I would have made that decision had I been in that same position. And so it is something that has touched me a lot, and I just want to offer people that hope and healing that comes knowing that there is another option and that there can be healing even after an abortion. Absolutely, and it's so important. Steve Lopez, tell us about why you're joining us here today on the Shilling Show and why this is important to you. Um, I'm, you know, for me, um, like I might have mentioned the last time I was here, for a very long time I didn't do anything about it, and mm-hmm. so for me it's kind of um, a fundamental rights issue. Uh, in my opinion, it's the great issue of our time, not unlike slavery, like we discussed that that there is actually an, an unalienable right to life. A lot of people hear right to life and think that's kind of just like a, re- a religious term Yes, when it's actually in the Declaration of Independence that we're created absolutely. with that. And, so, um, and it comes from God, by the way, exactly. endowed by our Creator for those who uh, have forgotten their history. Exactly. So I guess you know why I'm here is to kind of hearken back to what this nation was founded upon, those fundamental principles, because if we let those principles go, everything else kind of goes with it. You're so right. And isn't it interesting, though, that, that today, Steve, we have people who are arguing that, uh, you know, somehow this woman's right to choose, as we hear so often, trumps uh, the li- the right to life that is stated in the Declaration of Independence. I mean, I always am curious at that term because I say right to choose what? I mean, if you do nothing, if you do nothing, if you make no choice, you will have a child. 
the choice is that you're choosing to terminate a pregnancy and kill a child. So I, I don't want to hear this, you know, the right to, to choose because it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, people talk about the right to choose as if it's if, as if it's this universal right that we mm-hmm. just we we all have just a right to choose. Well, we have a right to go hunting and yeah. to ch- I have the right to choose to you know to, to go hunt deer or whatever. But I don't have a right to choose to shoot somebody. Nobody mm-hmm. says that. That's well, he's exercising his right to do whatever he wants. There's limits to those rights, and I think um, because we've ignored uh, the founding documents, we, yes, because it's so clear. Like when you go back and as a you know as a as kids, we read the Declaration of Independence. Um, or the Federalist Papers, uh, but then we forget about it. But we realize that like those issues that they faced are very similar to the issues that that we face, and it's and it's about tyranny. What happens when people can just do whatever they want? Uh, and you know, the Declaration of Independence was written to a king, right, to say, hey, you know, there there are limits. We have rights that come from God, and and when we say that those rights don't extend to the most innocent uh, members of our society, uh, we have we have a really big problem in America. We absolutely do, and we're talking with Abigail Seidman, uh, Christina Hampton, and Steve Lopez. Today, the theme of The Schilling Show is Lost Motherhood, Why Women Regret Their Abortions. We've got to go to a break in just a couple minutes, but Abigail, I did want to uh, introduce you before the break, and when we get back, I want to talk a lot about uh, your story and your testimony, which was absolutely amazing when I had a chance to read it this morning. Why are you here today? Um, I'm here today because I made the wrong choice as a teenager and that I was influenced by the culture I grew up in. I was raised in a femini- by a feminist mother who worked in an abortion clinic and believed absolutely in a woman's right to choose and specifically in a woman's right to choose, not a man's right to choose. Mm-hmm. My boyfriend at the time didn't have any say in what happened with the child he had helped to create. Um, and I was, you know, I was raised in that culture and with those beliefs and was never taught that abortion was anything other than good. You know, it's fascinating that you say that because there seems to be almost a cottage industry of of people saying things like, not only is is it not wrong to have an abortion, but it's good. I don't know if you all remember a few years ago, maybe four years ago, when they came out with these shirts for kids, the I had an abortion t-shirts that they were selling. Uh, and this this caused a national furor, but I believe these were being put out by Planned Parenthood. Uh, did did any of you ever see or hear of these shirts? I did. Yeah. What What was your I mean, what was your thought? I don't know if you were involved. I think it was probably about four years ago, but I, I don't know what your thought was and if you were involved in in pro life at the time. But how did that strike you, Christina Hampton? I think I was just starting to get in the pro life movement at mm-hmm. that time. It was, and I remember seeing those and at the. Since I was very new, it was just kind of shocking that anybody would support it because it's something like it's one thing to that you know most of the people who have abortions they hide it because it is such a, a moving thing like it's something that people see as private but then to try to push that as positive it's I remember it was it was odd but yeah I thought the same thing is you know what is what is behind this you know. And it's almost like we see this happening throughout society is that we're turning things around and we're exchanging the truth for a lie. <laughs> and then we're, we're putting young girls in. I mean, they were marketing these shirts. They were little baby doll shirts, uh, style shirts for young girls. I mean, they had them in, in teens and preteen sizes, as I remember. And I just thought, you know, this is disgusting what's happening here. But what we're seeing, I believe, is a move on on a part of people who want to change our culture Steve, as you said, that really anything goes. We can do whatever we want. We are not uh, under God's law. We're not under really any law. Let's just let us do what we want. And I think ultimately the result of that is chaos and mayhem. 977-1070 is the phone number here on The Schilling Show as we talk about lost motherhood, why women regret their abortions. We welcome your calls if you have comments or questions for our guest. And when we get back with uh, Christina Hampton, Steve Lopez, and Abigail Seidman, we're going to be talking about her testimony, what happened to her, her story, which really, I hope that people will take the opportunity to learn from it, because there's a lot of wisdom there in what happened in her life and hearing this story. The Schilling Show will be back right after the news. Beware. 
And really, it is what we're doing today in a most profound way, giving voice to the voiceless as we talk uh, with Abigail Seidman, uh, Christina Hampton, and Steve Lopez, Lost Motherhood, Why Women Regret Their Abortions, 977-1070 is the phone number. If you have comments or questions for our guests, we'd love to hear from you. And so, Abigail, I wanted to talk to you about your own situation, and you had referenced earlier that you made the wrong choice, and I know by reading your story and your testimony uh, how deeply you wish you could change things. But I think it's important for people to hear your own story. You referenced it very briefly, but I'd like to spend a little more time about the environment in which you grew up, because um, your mother was kind of a big part of uh, steering you toward an abortion. What was it like growing up in your house, and what were the things that you learned? Well, when I was very young, I had more of a normal sort of upbringing. Up until Mm -hmm. I was five, my parents went to Episcopal Church. They were very active in their church. We were just sort of your average suburban American family in the Midwest. And then when I was around 10 or 11, my mother had an abortion Mm -hmm. and became very radicalized by it is the best way I can put it. She decided that, you know, not only had abortion been the right choice for her at that time, but that it was good in an absolute moral sense good, and that these women who had run the abortion clinic and had helped her to get an abortion were helping women and that this was a positive good. My mother is a certified nurse. She's now a nurse practitioner. She obtained her nurse practitioner certification Mm -hmm. through Planned Parenthood. And, um, so she got at that point involved more involved in the abortion industry and a few years after that left regular nursing work entirely and became a full-time abortion and planned parenthood nurse. I want to ask you as a child uh you mentioned that your mother had an abortion when you were 11? Yeah. Yeah. Did she tell you? Did she have a little family meeting? I mean, how did this all come about and how did you process that? Um, she she told me, she told my father and I, maybe a year or so later, it was because I asked, you know, why why are we suddenly in, involved in this? Because mm-hmm. I, I didn't know what abortion was mm-hmm. until that point. I was kind of a sheltered kid. Well, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea what abortion was or that such a, I, was, I remember being horrified by the idea that, that something like this was legal, was not only legal, but was being celebrated, that my mother felt it was a good thing and that I was going to remain an only child because of it. I'd always, it especially hurt me because I'd always wanted a sibling. And so you got this news and you were horrified by it. Was there anything you could do to process it? Did you have anybody to talk to about it or did you actually have to to bear this cross on your own as an 11-year-old? I really had to bear it on my own. My father did not want to discuss it. I have a strong feeling that the child was not his. I see. So he he probably just didn't want to have anything to do with the decision or yeah. conversation or anything yeah, he at was, all. He was silent on it. He didn't want to talk about it. So you had this information and you were horrified initially. In the ensuing years, as you were in this kind of culture of celebration of abortion uh, because of your mom's involvement in this, did your thoughts as a, as a child uh, evolving into a teenager change because this is what you were immersed in? They externally they did, internally they didn't. There was a lot of conflict in me because externally my mother not only got radically involved in the feminist movement Mm -hmm. and in abortion culture, but she forced me into it as well. She would pull me out of school to be an escort at the abortion clinic. She pulled me out of school to go on protest marches for women's rights and abortion rights and gay rights. We were on the news frequently. She was an officer in our regional now chapter. What, so, what does this mean to be an, an escort at the abortion clinic? And, and is that still a practice that goes on today? What is that? It is a practice that go, it depends. It varies clinic by clinic. It depends on where the clinic is physically located, what its access is like, um, if the especially if the access is on a public roadway or mm-hmm. on a public sidewalk. Um, since sidewalk counselors, protesters, whatever form it takes. But since people who are pro-life have the right to stand on public sidewalks and public right-of-ways, and if the entrance to the clinic is on a public sidewalk, they can't block entrance to the clinic, mm-hmm. but clinics have a obviously have a vested interest in shepherding women past sidewalk counselors steering them past people who may have signs that they don't want them to read, may have literature they don't want them to take, may be saying things to them that they don't want them to hear. 
And what an escort's job is, is to go and meet the woman and her partner or parent or whoever else is with her at the car and physically guide them through however many pro-lifers there are and into the clinic without letting them have have time to have conversations with sidewalk counselors or accept any literature. That was our twofold job is to prevent them from conversing with the sidewalk counselors and prevent them from receiving any of the flyers or handouts. Christina Hampton uh, w- with 40 Days for Life and Steve Lopez, I know both of you are familiar with what goes on at the local abortion clinic Planned Parenthood. Uh, are, are they using escorts here locally that either of you have witnessed? Are you aware of that? Um, they do not use them here locally because of the way the entrance is stationed. So, so they, they don't need to. They don't need to at all. Like where the people enter is private property and we cannot go there. It, it seems that that would once again perhaps, Abigail, cause great angst to a teenager who's who's already conflicted about this in walking people in and hearing these messages around you. How did you take that, and did did that give you kind of a Stockholm syndrome for the people going in, or did you still have this feeling that, gosh, what I'm doing is wrong, but I have to do it, or did you just not know? It was the, gosh, what I'm doing is wrong, but I have to do it feeling, especially mm-hmm. since, I mean, there aren't, you know, patients obviously are not coming in every second of every day. They come yes. in every 5, 10, 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. In between those times, we would sit in the clinic parking lot. We had lawn chairs and a cooler and things for the escorts in the parking lot. And we would just sit there and wait for the next patient to come. And obviously the people, the sidewalk counselors, the people holding signs, the pro-lifers were right there next to us. They mm-hmm. were on the public sidewalk. We were on the private property, but we were feet away from each other. And they would talk to us. I mean, we can't, you know, you can't prevent people from talking to you. Right. So I would be sitting there staring at their signs. They would often target me because I was so young, because mm-hmm. I was a, you know, 12 to 16 year old girl and everyone else was adults. A lot of them were men. You reference that in your earlier life that uh, when you were a child that your parents went to Episcopal Church and so on. Was there a, a, a time when your mother got involved in all of these other feminist politics and the pro-abortion politics that she stopped going to church, or did she continue? How did the faith life progress along with this political movement life? The faith life had basically dropped off. Um, She had started to get involved in the feminist politics before she got involved in abortion specifically. By Mm -hmm. the time I was uh, five or six, we... By the time I was five, we were down to Christmas and Easter church, and by the time I was six, we did not go to church anymore. And then by the time I was 11 and she had the abortion and got heavily involved, by then it was, you know, it was goddess worship. She had goddess worship figurines and goddess chants in the house, and we were, you know, she was a pagan goddess worshiper and had nothing more to do with Christianity. The reason I ask is because I know here in Charlottesville there are pro-death churches, and when I say pro-death churches, I mean churches that support quote-unquote abortion rights. I call them pro-death churches, and I wanted to just hear from you. Obviously, that was a different path because your mom just got away from it altogether. Yes, there were other women who worked at the clinic with her who did go to Christian churches. And they reconciled that somehow. They were what you call pro-death churches. They were very liberal churches who supported the women in there. And and basically ignored the Word of God, in essence, in many, many ways. We're talking with Abigail Seidman, uh, post-abortive pro-life mother. Also with us, Christina Hampton, 40 Days for Life, and Steve Lopez, pro-life filmmaker. Christina, is there a a 40 Days for Life event coming up soon, and uh, what can we tell people about that? Yes, there is. There's a 40 Days for Life starting next Wednesday, September 22nd, and it'll be going to October 31st. Mm-hmm. Um, it's from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. We'll have the vigil outside of Planned Parenthood. But the main focus of the 40 Days for Life is prayer and fasting for the people participating. And one way that people can find out is by going to the website and they sign up. If they sign up there on the website, the national team sends them a daily devotional so they can participate in the prayers. And by fasting, they give up something that's separating them from God. And by uniting all of this with God's will, like great things have been happening all over the country through 40 Days for Life. If people would like to become involved in that event or get more information, do you have a website you can give us right now? Yes, it's www40, the number 40, daysforlife.com slash Charlottesville. All righty, and we would, uh, we'll see if uh, Leon can get that up on the show notes page. We'll probably do this over the break in case people missed out on it. All righty, it's a very important show today as we talk about lost motherhood, why women regret their abortions. And when we get back, we're going to hear more 
about Abigail Seidman's testimony, the abortion that she had, and what happened afterwards, because I think that is really a lesson for many people in the listening audience. It doesn't just stop with that act, but there's a downward spiral that happens in many, if not most, women's and men's lives who are involved in abortion. The Schilling Show returns right after this. And we are heading into the final segment of The Schilling Show for this hour. Lost Motherhood, Why Women Regret Their Abortions. Abigail Seidman, a post-abortive pro-life mother. Christina Hampton from 40 Days for Life. And Steve Lopez, a pro-life filmmaker. And so, Abigail, you were in school, in college, and you found out you were pregnant. You really were in denial about it, weren't you? You just didn't didn't even yes. think it was possible. It, it didn't even occur to me. I mean, I'd, I'd been raised with, you know, use condoms, safe sex, and so I did, and they have a failure rate, and I was one of the unlucky ones. And and I think that's an important message also, is that, you know, these are kind of uh, put forward and marketed as everything's going to be fine, just use a condom, and, and the fact is that it's not fine, and people get diseases and illnesses and pregnant in spite of the fact that a condom was used. And so that's that's one of the myths that needs to be dispelled, and you certainly can tell the story about it. And so when you found out, you obviously had a lot of emotions and you thought about different things. What was your initial decision, and also in, in talking with your dad and your boyfriend, uh, what did you think you were going to do about all this? Um, my initial reaction was that I I didn't want to have an abortion. I had always just felt it was wrong, and once I I really felt you know that there was something alive inside me. I can't really you know it was a spirit at the time. I didn't have a spiritual language to mm-hmm. explain these things, but I felt a life inside me, and I didn't want to kill it. So I I talked to my boyfriend at the time about it, and. He was still in high school. He wasn't ready to raise a child together, mm-hmm. but he felt he he felt adoption was the best idea. He did not want me to have an abortion. And you were you were along the same lines of thinking. That's what you had initially decided that you would adopt this child out. Yes. And so then you spoke with your dad. And where was your dad on this whole thing? My dad felt that my that it was my choice, and my choice means my choice, and I can choose abortion, I can choose adoption, or I can choose to raise a child. And he kind of wanted you to maybe come home and, and keep the child? Yeah, he. I, I think he maybe just had... Some some people don't really think adoption is... A, I don't I really understand why, but some people just don't think adoption is a good idea, or I think my dad just you know wanted me back home again. And then you also had the opportunity to speak with with a counselor uh, about this. And uh, what was that like? And and what happened in that conversation? Um, I spoke with a counselor at my college who was a Catholic woman. It was a nominally Catholic college. Mm -hmm. And the first thing she said to me when I came in and said I'm pregnant is she said congratulations. And I was wow. I had never heard someone say congratulations to a pregnant woman before. This mm. is the culture I was raised in. My I'd never goodness, heard that. And and she gave you some options. I mean, it looked like everything was going to be okay. What did she offer to you, and and what happened? She said, you know, that because the college was pro life and supported students either parenting or choosing adoption, that mm-hmm. there were a lot of resources available. And when I said adoption looked like the best choice for me, she you know, just had immediate access to adoption agencies, potential adoptive parents. She said, you know, let me make some calls. You know, there, you're not the first girl who's been in this situation, and I'm sure you won't be the last. And there are people out there who would love to adopt your child, who would love to help you out personally. I told her a bit of my family situation, yeah. that my family, my mother in particular, would not be supportive. And then you made the call that you dreaded having to make because you knew what was coming. You called your mom. Tell us about that phone call and your mother's reaction. I called my mom and I told her that I was pregnant. I was about six weeks pregnant. And she instantly said, you know, don't worry, we'll take care of it. I've been waiting for this. Not we'll take care of the child, we'll take care of the pregnancy. Yes. Yeah. Take care of it by getting rid of it. Right. 
And um, the language you used to describe this, it was just, it was almost haunting. It's like there, there was some sort of uh, celebration that, that your mom wanted to have, uh, that this was a rite of passage and a joyful event. I just, I, I just was kind of astounded at that. Is, am I characterizing it correctly? Yeah, that's, that was basically the culture she was in, mm-hmm. is that abortion was not only necessary at times, but that it was good, that it was empowering for a woman to have an abortion, that it was part of an important part of growing up, that it was like a rite of passage, but that pre-motherhood you should at least have one abortion. That was something that people said a lot, and that it was it was kind of a celebratory thing. It was like, you know, in some cultures they might celebrate a a girl getting her first period, or they mm-hmm. might celebrate. You know, people celebrate marriage. They celebrate births. They celebrate birthdays. In that, in the culture my mother was in, abortion was another occasion to celebrate. Yeah, it's a terrible sickness that's uh, befallen this country that we have that sort of culture around, and and how sad it is that we would think that was something to celebrate. Now we have just a few minutes left, and I want to make sure that we we get through this, but. Um, you told your mom what you wanted to do, and her basic reaction was, if you do that, I'm cutting you off financially. Yeah, that was. she was very angry. She was screaming at me, and that was her reaction, is I'm cutting you off financially and socially. Basically, you are no longer my daughter. And so you went through thinking about this, crying in tears, and what was your ultimate decision? My ultimate decision was that I wanted to stay in college and I was dependent on my mother. My parents were divorced and she was the one with the financial power to make college happen. And so you chose to have an abortion. Your mother bought your plane tickets and flew you there. What was the experience like? It was it was difficult. It was difficult having to stuff everything down inside. I first turned to alcohol to cope with it during mm-hmm. that time. I drank before the flight, I drank while I was there. It was, you know, the house was full of her friends. They were, you know, partying and celebrating. When I had the abortion, there were about six, seven people in the room, which is not My common, goodness. but this was a special occasion. This was her daughter's first abortion, and people had people had driven from a hundred or so miles away to visit. To come and celebrate and have a nice dinner afterwards. You mentioned they, yeah. they, they went for ice cream and you didn't really want to do that, but it was just everyone was having a, a good time on your account. Yeah, and I just, you know, I just sort of kept quiet about it. But ultimately what happened was a, a real downward spiral in your life and in the life of your boyfriend, your then boyfriend as well, what happened to you and what happened to him in our remaining couple minutes? Because I want people to understand what can happen. Well, I went back to college and I tried to cope. I've con- I continued. Drink- alcohol was really my only way to cope. So obviously you're not going to do well in school if you're drunk all the time. I was mm-hmm. drunk at classes. I didn't get homework done because I was drinking. I did okay. I had a straight A average when I dropped out. But my social life was non-existent. My boyfriend was doing the same thing at home in high school. His grades did suffer. He just spent all his time drinking and smoking pot. He stopped doing homework, stopped doing music, athletics, everything he did. He just hung around the house drunk and stoned. And so this was your life for a while. You went on to get married and to have children. You have two beautiful boys now, ages three and five. And you've also had a change of heart. What happened to you after all these years? What was it that finally showed you that uh, you could be forgiven and that life could actually resume in a good way for you? In the in the end, it was um, around the beginning of this year. I had been, my older son was diagnosed with autism, and mm-hmm. I had been looking for, you know, support groups or resources. I the, All of them seemed to be religious in nature, mostly Christian. And I just, you know, I didn't feel really ready to deal with that. So I asked on an atheist website, are there any secular atheist groups for parents of autistic children? And the response was overwhelmingly, we're sorry you couldn't find out and abort your child. In time. Wow. And so you found out that it wasn't going to come from that arena. Yeah. I, I realized this, is, this, this isn't my culture. This isn't my people. This isn't where I belong. Maybe... And I thought, well, maybe I can, you know, just go and sort of be culturally Christian and at mm-hmm. least I'll have friends who will think it's 
a, a blessing or a challenge or good that I'm raising an autistic child and not just a tragedy and he should be, he'd be better off dead. So but, I, I, I walked into a church and it, I was just sort of overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit while I was there. And what a story and what a transformation you have in, in reading your story that you've written down your testimony, Abigail Seidman. I'm so thankful that you came here today to share with us uh, the bad and the good, the pain and the joy in your life. And uh, we will certainly keep you in our prayers as things move along for you. One more time, if we could get the information, Christina Hampton, for the 40 Days for Life event and how people can get in touch with you. You've got about a minute left. All right. It's starting next Wednesday, September 22nd. If they want more information, they can go to the website. It's www.40daysforlife.com slash Charlottesville. And there's also the local email address for the 40 Days for Life campaign is Seville 40 days Seville the number 40 days at gmail.com. So they can contact us, get some more information, or visit the website. Great. And we have a link up at uh, show notes on shillingshow.com also if you'd like to get that information later. Steve Lopez, we haven't had a lot of time to talk with you today, but I know you were listening as I was and just uh, marveling at this story, at this testimony. We've got about 30 seconds left for you to kind of just give your closing thoughts about this issue. Well, one thing I think that we, we've learned listening to Abigail, and one of the things you learn when you participate in 40 Days for Life that um, there's actually a cost to abortion. You know, a lot of times people become mothers and fathers. They're trying to av- avoid a problem. And in listening to Abigail, you realize that there's an, you're creating a much larger problem that sometimes people carry for, you know, 15, 20, 30 years. And so I think the nice message that we have here today is that there is healing. And so if you've, you've had an abortion, you know, some of the strongest pro-lifers are post the board of mothers and fathers. It's very true. I want to thank you all for coming in and sharing these stories with us today. Maybe we even saved a life somewhere along the way. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Thanks so much. All righty, The Schilling Show will return after the break. We're going to spend some time on the phones talking about what's going on with the Albemarle County and the Charlottesville School Boards, the hidden appointment processes. And then Dr. Mark Reineke, little ways to keep calm and carry on when The Schilling Show returns. 